Hello everybody and welcome back to a new video. Today I have something very special in my hand, the Nikon D2X. This camera was announced in 2004 and released in 2005. That means it is over 17 years old by now. But wait before you write it off because when you see the results from this camera, your mind will be blown. When this camera was released, I was 3 years old. I'm 21 now. And this camera was released for a price tag of $5,500. Now that isn't cheap, but this was pretty much the best camera in the world at the time. And reviewers agreed, this camera got so much praise on release, it is actually shocking. The original DP review article about it from 2005 wrote, as a photographic tool it's as close to perfection as I could imagine. There's really very little else you could want from a camera. Ken Rockwell's article on the D2X is equally positive. It works fantastically. It feels like an effortless extension of your consciousness. It was even crowned Professional Camera of the Year for 2005 and 2006 by the European Imaging and Sound Association. In their publication about it, they wrote, It is hard to imagine any digital camera rivaling the extraordinary performance of Nikon's D2X. This rugged high-end model has been designed to satisfy the most demanding professionals and includes every function and feature imaginable. This camera was so good that people literally couldn't imagine any camera being better than this one in the future. That thought seems a bit silly now, now that we've had about 17 years of technological innovation, but it provokes an interesting thought. 17 years ago people were also taking amazing photos. What is stopping anybody from taking this camera nowadays and also taking world-class images? And that's the reason why I bought this camera, to test that hypothesis and to explore whether or not this camera, that is now a relic by modern standards, is still a good option for photographers on a budget today. Well, at least that's what I tell myself. The more probable answer is that I just can't handle money in a responsible way. To test this camera to its fullest potential, I packed my bags and I got some french fries. Oh yeah, and I was in the coolest old industrial park you could wish for. On this day it was very very hot. Visiting a collection of asphalt streets and brick buildings in the harsh noon sun in the height of summer while bringing the heaviest camera that I own was not one of my best ideas I have to admit. But for photos the conditions were actually great. This type of harsh lighting is perfect for taking photos of architecture in my opinion because it helps accentuate any structures. I started off at this extremely asymmetrical building. I only found it because it was right next to the parking lot. The seemingly random placement of windows on this building looks silly but made for some nice photos. It's pretty crazy to think that I bought this camera for 150 euro, a very far ways off from the original $5500 MSRP. I bought it in a well-worn condition. The pads on the grips are a bit scuffed and there is a pad missing at one location but otherwise it works perfectly. 150 euro is an insane price for a camera of this caliber, especially considering it costs less than this little thumb grip for a Leica. Well, how much camera did I get for 150 euro? Over a kilo it turns out. Coming in at 1070 grams or 2.4 pounds, for the body this is a chonky boy. Unfortunately I had picked the day before to do a workout and now every time I lifted the camera to take a photo I could feel my sore noodly appendages ache. In this massive housing is a 12.4 megapixel APS-C sensor with 11 autofocus points. By today's standards 12 megapixels isn't a lot but it's still plenty. It has been shown time and time again that even for larger prints 12 megapixel is completely fine. 11 autofocus points isn't a lot by modern standards. My mirrorless cameras have around 400 of them. Here's the thing, you need a lot of autofocus points to do fancy stuff like eye detection AF or stuff like that, but when you get down to the basics you really don't need more than one AF point if you know what you're doing. Even if you don't know what you're doing you don't need more than one AF point. Okay, let me explain before angry nerds have finished typing their comments. One AF point is all you need, because you only need the center AF point. I even do this on my modern mirrorless cameras. I'm not exactly sure how other people do this. I think some people just leave their autofocus zones in complete auto. I think some people use the joystick on some cameras to move around the focus point. And I think some people use the touchscreen to tap where they want to focus. But all of these options are a lot worse than just using one autofocus point in the middle. All you need to do is point the center of your frame at your subject, 
then focus and then recompose. And that's all you need to do. And it's a lot quicker than anything else. I mean, street photographers and Leica owners and pretty much any rangefinder camera from the past like 70 years does this because the rangefinder patch is in the center of the frame. And it's so much quicker. All you have to do is focus and take the photo. Focus, take the photo. And it's just a flick of the wrist. It's so much quicker than anything else. So no, you don't need more than one AF point. Okay, let's get back to the task at hand, eating fries. After having eaten the fries, my socially awkward ass had to buy from the extremely chatty woman selling the fries. It was finally time to take photos of some old stuff. By the way, I only had one lens with me, the DX 35mm f1.8, which results in a 50mm equivalent on the APS-C sensor of the D2X. But this is an amazing lens for the price. I paid around 110 euro for it years ago and I've been getting a lot of use out of it since. Going further into the park, the sheer scale of everything is quite impressive. What I love is that there is so much depth here. Wherever you point your camera, you have multiple bridges and buildings and chimneys across the frame. Especially this weird looking ferris wheel was really nice. I wish I could be like, oh yeah, and then we walked past the coal infusion furnace thing. But I have absolutely no idea what all of this stuff is called, so you're just gonna have to live with my subpar descriptions. The region of Germany I live in is known for this type of industry and has been for at least a century. But I just can't help and think about old USSR infrastructure at this location. It looks very similar to images you see of broken and abandoned USSR infrastructure like Chernobyl. It looks so surreal sometimes, especially because everything just looks like it's stacked on top of each other. It feels like something you would build in a Minecraft mod pack. Walking further along the super long building, we came across a really fancy furniture shop. I love taking photos of nice interiors, but I rarely get the chance to do it. I also took a few photos with the a7R2 I was filming with because I had a wide angle on it and wide angles always look amazing for interiors. And that brings me to an interesting point. How does the Nikon D2X stack up against a mirrorless camera? Here's the thing with mirrorless cameras. They are quite slow, especially from a couple of years ago, those mirrorless cameras are pretty slow. Like my a7R2 that I'm filming on right now, it takes about 3-5 to five seconds to turn on and then I'm finally able to take a photo. This camera, on the other hand, is super quick. Let's just do a quick test. I'm gonna hold the shutter button and then I'm gonna turn it on at the same time. And we're just gonna see how fast it's gonna be. It just, it, it's instant. It just releases instantly. Here is another excerpt from Ken Rockwell's review. Everything happens immediately and there isn't anything that you need to do that you can't do with this. And he isn't wrong. This camera's speed is staggering. Mirrorless cameras from like 2014 or so, they're basically just a camera with a 2014 smartphone in the back. And if you compare this workhorse with a bunch of efficient embedded systems in it to a smartphone from 2014, it's like comparing a drag race car to my bicycle. I was also pretty surprised by the autofocus on this. It's really quick. There is a toggle on the left here, which is really cool for uh, yeah, single AF, continuous and manual focus. And you can just switch between them. And when I saw continuous, I was like, wait, they had continuous autofocus back then. And yeah, it's actually really quick. It's, it's surprisingly quick. Modern cameras have one big upside though. This camera can easily go up to ISO 6400 or even 12800 without any problems and still produce usable results. This camera, on the other hand, can go up to ISO 800 for its native ISO. It can also be pushed to high 1 and high 2, those are the names of the modes for ISO 1600 and 3200. That might not sound great, but if you put it into context for the time back then, film was usually available around ISO 800, at least for color film, that was pretty much the highest you can get. Maybe ISO 1600 for some films, but those weren't too common. So having ISO 1600 or 3200 on here at least was a big step up from film. And the ISO performance isn't that bad. If you move into higher ISOs, you're definitely gonna lose a bit of sharpness and introduce some noise, but Lightroom does a great job of converting that noise into grain. And if you convert those images into black and white, you can easily go to ISO 3200 and make that grain work in your favor. Also, if it's really too dark, you can just get a flash. Next, I stumbled upon this parking garage that was really cool and someone had randomly parked their Jaguar in the perfect place, the only place in the whole garage where light could hit the car. 
I don't know why I was so lucky on this day, but every photo opportunity just presented itself to me and I just kept stumbling into perfect photo spots. The weight and size of this camera might be a turn off for some people, but it's actually this camera's biggest strength. The ergonomics of this camera are amazing. It has big grips which make it comfortable to hold, the vertical grip is great, the button placement just makes sense and the best part is, it has buttons for pretty much everything. There's no need to search the menus or whatever, this camera has a hardware switch or button for pretty much everything you could want to change during a shoot. There is a switch for changing the focus region, the metering mode, bracketing settings, whatever you want to change you can do it super quickly. Especially if you have the muscle memory for it, you can even do it without looking at the camera. Mirrorless cameras now have a history of subpar ergonomics. You just can't beat a big professional body like this one. On the way to the car, I found one more photo opportunity. Two big metal structures. I actually looked this one up and apparently they were used for liquefying water again that was used for cooling and had vaporized. One more thing I haven't mentioned yet is the fact that this camera has the Nikon F mount and can use pretty much any F mount lens from the past like 70 years or so. It has the necessary hardware to drive AFD lenses and those can be had for super cheap. I literally pulled two lenses out of a bin that my local camera store was trying to get rid of and I got those for basically free and they work perfectly with this camera. They're not the quickest. AFF AFS lenses, those are the more modern ones, are gonna get you way quicker AF in my experience. If you're a beginner photographer, this is a huge benefit because if you can get more lenses affordably, that means you can test a lot more lenses and you can learn a lot more about different types of lenses. For many mirrorless systems, the lenses are quite expensive. For example, this is the 35mm f2 on the Fujifilm X mount and this is probably the cheapest option you can buy for the X mount and it's around 200 euro. For that kind of money you can get a lot better options for the Nikon F mount. For 200 bucks you can probably get two to three decent lenses for the Nikon F mount. One of my favorites, as I already mentioned, is the 35mm f1.8 and I've also seen a couple macro lenses that you can get for cheap and I've seen a bunch of AFD lenses that can also be had for cheap. So I think for two to 300 euro you can buy some very decent lenses and then yeah, if you're a beginner photographer, that's pretty much all you need to learn photography. To conclude, this camera is freaking amazing. I mean for 150 euro, what else can you buy for 150 euro? Like two Sony batteries and with inflation maybe like a cookie as well? Like this is absolutely insane for the price. For 150 euro you can get a full pro body camera with amazing ergonomics, great tactile feedback, amazing image quality and access to the best lenses and the most affordable lens system out there. It's pretty much all you need. To be honest, I would even use this for a commercial shoot in the right conditions because this is dependable, the image quality is good enough and it just has this amazing body that is a joy to use. The only thing that I wouldn't be too sure about is the CF Express card I have in here. I got it from a friend, huge shout out to him, but I don't know how often this has changed owners and I don't know how good this still is. I wouldn't trust this one that much, but that isn't a fault of the camera. Thank you everybody for watching this far in the video. I'm not even gonna ask you to subscribe or like or anything because I'm just happy when somebody watches my videos to the end because I put so much work into it. And yeah, thank you everybody for watching this far. And if you have any thoughts on the Nikon D series like the D2X or the D3 or the D4 or something like that, then leave your thoughts down below and I will definitely read them. And yeah, see you in the next video. Bye bye.